All right, and I have a silly little theme song idea. Are you ready for it? Let's go. <laughs> it's Nosh and Schmooze, Nosh and Schmooze, where we talk about cool stuff concerning the Jews and everybody else. Welcome uh, everyone to Nosh and Schmooze. We're so glad you could join us today. We have a very, very, very special guest today. I'm so glad we have Nigel Savage with us today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nigel. Um, we're going to be talking about why it's important that we have a Jewish lab for sustainability today. Um, as always, if you have questions or comments for Nigel, please leave them in the comment section on Facebook and I will field your questions to him. But first, a bit about my guest. Nigel Savage founded Hazon, the Jewish Lab for Sustainability in 2000. Hazon has grown steadily each year since then. Today, they have a wide range of programs, all focused on turning Jewish life outward to create a more sustainable world for all and strengthening Jewish life in the process in vital and innovative ways. Hazon is one of only two groups to have been recognized in every single slingshot guide. They have also been recognized by the Sierra Club as one of the 50 leading faith-based environmental organizations. In 2015, Nigel was awarded an honorary doctorate by the Jewish Theological Seminary. He has twice been named a member of the Forward 50, the annual list of the 50 most influential Jewish people in the United States. Before founding Hazon, Nigel was a professional fund manager in London, where he worked for N.M. Rothschild and was co-head of UK equities at Govit. He has an MA in history from Georgetown and has learned at Pardes, Yakar, and Hebrew University. He was a founder of Limud New York and serves on the board of Romamu. Nigel executive produced the British independent movies Solitaire for Two and Stiff Upper Lips and had an acclaimed cameo appearance in the cult Anglo-Jewish comic movie Leon the Pig Farmer. He is believed to be the first English Jew to have cycled across South Dakota on a recumbent bike. And uh, I, I will not refute that. I, I believe that that has to be true. Uh, so Nigel, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad you're here. Rachel, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And uh, you know, I, I'm just wondering, my first question is given that as a society and as, a, as individuals, um, you know, folks are concerned about climate crisis. Why aren't we doing more? So, um, so Rachel, thank you for asking that question. And first of all, I just wanna say it's so great to see you. It's so great to be part of this. I'm so honored to be invited. I wanna tell those of you who came from the Northeast, it's snowing here in uh, New York right now. And just looking at your sunny background, I feel the warmth. Of, uh, of Hollywood, Florida. So yeah, why don't we do more? I think it's a really, really great place to start and a really important question. Um, because people know that we're burning up the world and we're over consuming it. And so I think it's a legitimate question. I think there are two reasons. Firstly, for the challenges that we have, we like goodies and baddies and we wanna be amongst the goodies. And secondly, we wanna be able to define success. So if you think, for example, about the fight against apartheid, people said, firstly, they're racist, I'm not racist. And secondly, they said, um, wouldn't, wouldn't it be amazing? We should have a free democratic South Africa. Wouldn't it be amazing if Nelson Mandela was president? And it took a lot of people, a lot of decades, but in due course, there was a free democratic South Africa and Nelson Mandela was president. Um, the same was true of the Jewish community fighting to defend Israel at the time of the, the Yom Kippur War. Like there are a whole series of things like that. And the key issue in relationship to the environmental crisis is that firstly, there are no real goodies and baddies. It's true, we can talk about the oil companies and like there are a few bad actors out there, but fundamentally, we've all just grown up in the world that we've grown up in. And we're on too many airplanes and our homes are too big and we eat too much meat and we do a whole bunch of things that we're gradually learning aren't really good for the world. And so we feel guilty about it. That's the first thing. And second thing is that we can't easily define success. There's no likelihood in our lifetime of us seeing a headline in the New York Times, great news, climate change fixed, go back to how you were. And the reason I begin with these two things is because I think for each person who's watching this conversation right now, 
it's worth before anything else just sitting with those things and just noticing what it feels like that we feel guilty whenever somebody raises this topic and what it feels like also that the topic just feels so big and so overwhelming that we can't define we can't really imagine success because those two things together really disempower us and at that point we like turn the page can't deal with this let me deal with something else Whereas instead, what I think we need to say is we need to say, okay, okay, there are no perfect goodies and baddies, fine. But still Jewish tradition teaches like, take one step, do one thing. Same thing with defining success. We don't have to have an image of perfection. We simply need to say, okay, how can I be better? How can my community be better? How can this country be better? So that's why, that's why I think we don't do more. And that's why I think it's an important place to start. And you mentioned, uh, you know, that it is a Jewish value uh, to say, okay, this is the next step. Now what? Um, so why is it specifically important that there is a Jewish lab for sustainability? So, yeah. So on the one hand, I think there are all sorts of places in Jewish tradition that we can legitimately say that the tradition actually teaches us to protect the world. And that goes from the creation story and Gan Eden to saying, food brachot, food blessings to sanctify the food that we eat to an injunction not to waste and so on. But I actually am personally in certain ways less interested in that. I simply feel that right now there is a human obligation to do what we can to engage the climate crisis. And in that regard, you don't have to be Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Catholic or Mormon or not religious or anything else. But what I think is the case is that to address the climate crisis, it needs everybody. It needs every supranational organization. It needs every country, including the United States. It needs every city. It needs the private sector. And it needs the world's religions because we have a certain kind of moral force. For the Catholics six years ago, the Pope, as the senior rabbi, as it were, for a billion Catholics, published Laudato Si and he said, if you're Catholic, you have to take this seriously. And I think as Jews, we think of being Jewish as meaning that we're on the right side of the biggest issues on history. Like that's, that's what we believe in. That's why we want our kids and our grandkids to grow up Jewishly. We think it's a wise tradition. We think it's a morally good tradition. And so literally we can't be good Jews and we can't be good Jewish communities right now going into the third decade of the 21st century if we're not addressing this issue. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that. I think Kazon brings into the fold, um, you know, Jewish folks who otherwise may not have been exposed to, um, you know, the teachings and the the actions that that we can be taking, um, but also that it is just it's for everybody. Um, so Nigel, I suspect that there are some folks that right now um, are so consumed with the pandemic and the inconveniences, but more so the tragedies uh, that we're facing because of it, um, that climate crisis has taken a back seat for some. Do you feel that these two issues are interconnected? Also a great question. So 2020 was a really interesting year in relationship to the climate crisis, the organized Jewish community did nothing because we just had no attention all of the reasons that you just said. For synagogues and temples, it was, what are we gonna do for the high holidays? For all of the school programs and camps, what are we doing with our kids? At the level of human needs, who are the people who are in need and what are the health needs and what are the food needs and poverty and so on and so forth. First of all, I just think it's interesting now that it's 2021, we're gradually coming out of this, right? The vaccines are out there. As every day goes by, more people are vaccinated. The days are getting longer. If not a, a new government, the, the, the federal government is now taking this issue really seriously. We're at the start of a new four year cycle uh, in political life in this country. So first of all, in general, as this year goes on, people's time horizons are gonna lengthen. It's gonna happen differently for each person and each family, depending on their own circumstances. But gradually we're gonna come back to life and we're gonna gradually come back to some version of normal, which isn't quite gonna be exactly the same as normal two years ago. But I actually think that by this summer, in all sorts of ways, it's going to feel normal. People are going to be traveling. They're going to be out there. The restaurants are going to be full. Programs are going to be open. As that happens, I think there is a moment 
to reflect back on COVID and say, what are the lessons for this? from this? What have, what have we learned and how do we play it forwards? Now, clearly there is a lesson, for example, about public health and the need to have strong systems of organizations for public health in every country in the world, but including this one, because frankly, if we had better public health, fewer people would have died, right? Including people who might know who have died and, and probably other people watching this uh, our conversation right now. But it's not just about public health. COVID in a sense was an extreme version of the climate conversation because it's ultimately about human behavior. It's about 7 billion people living on our one small planet. And it's about understanding that our own behaviors can have negative consequences. And in relationship to COVID, if we had done all sorts of things much earlier, including the Chinese government, the American government, the British government, then actually things would have played out really differently. Well, that's the story as a society that we now face for the next 10 and 20 and 30 years relating to the climate crisis. And truthfully, it's gonna be particularly acute along the Florida coast. If, if we have more climate warming, we will have more extreme weather events. And if we have more extreme weather events, that whole section of coast, including Hollywood and up and down it, north and south, is gonna be exposed. And so COVID in that sense is our wake up call. Absolutely. And I also think about just how, you know, if we had not encroached on the environment as much as we had in the first place, that, um, you know, these viruses that have come from animals, um, like, would not have, you know, infiltrated humans to begin with. Um, but, you know, we, we keep encroaching. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, you know, I think that that, um, sea level rise is something that um, Floridians have in the back of their minds probably all the time, but um, you know, it's, it's becoming more real and something that we need to start talking about. Um, so, and, and actually I am going to have some uh, local folks as guests later on um, in the season talking about sea level rise and what we can do in South Florida as a community um, to, to combat it. Uh, so Nigel, Hazon has brought the concept of Shemitah back into the foreground of Jofi organizations um, conversations. So, and for those folks who don't know what that is, Jewish Outdoor Food Farming and Environmental Education Organizations. Can you speak to the significance of Shemitah in our lives today? Yeah, so um, I love that question. So um, the Shemitah year in Jewish tradition is the sabbatical year. It's in the Torah. It's mentioned in multiple places in the Torah. It says that once every seven years, the land should lie fallow. The corners of your field should be available to anybody who's living there. Debt should be canceled. In reality, in the 21st century, this is what happens. Outside of Israel, and certainly outside of the Orthodox community, basically nobody's ever heard of it. In the Orthodox community, in one or two other places, as the Shemitah year begins, there are one or two classes about it. And in Israel, every seven years, there's an argument about the price of vegetables between the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox who have different views about what you can eat. And everybody else just kind of like rolls their eyes and it's like, seriously, what are you guys talking about? And it's material now because the Shemitah year, the sabbatical year is going to start this Rosh Hashanah. It starts on September, September 6th. Now, in fact, let's just step back for a little bit. First of all, let's just ask again what Shemitah is about. Well, it's about boundaries, community, relationship to food, equality and inequality, our relationship to time, our relationship to work and rest and overwork. Every single one of those issues is a real issue in this country and in the world right now. So the first thing is that when as a community, and I totally invite you to do this at Temple Bethel, do it with some of your educators, do it with the rabbis, have a whole schmooze session just learning about Shemitah, when you start to unpack these conversations, you very quickly go from old texts in the Torah to some really deep conversations about our values and how we live today. And that's really at the heart of what it means to be Jewish, I think, in the 21st century, to engage the tradition, to help us at some level be better Jews and better people. Second thing I would say more prosaically is 
Every single Jewish institution runs on the Jewish calendar. Tuesday is different than Shabbat. Hanukkah is different than Seder night. Uh, Pesach is different than Kol Nidre night. So given that, the question for Temple Bethel and for every Jewish institution is, how are we going to register the Shemitah year on the calendar in this coming year? How are things going to be different? At the very least, I want to suggest that it would be an amazing time, particularly as we come out of COVID, to think the Shemitah year is the seventh year in the cycle. So this is completing a series in Jewish time that runs from 2015 to 2022. I think it would be amazing for Temple Bethel to do a short series. Looking back on the last seven years, what's happened to us as a community? What's happened in Hollywood? What's happened in this country? What have we learned? And then to start to envision September of 2029, the seven year period from 2022 to 2029 and say, okay, our community, what do we want it to look like seven years from now? Seven years is long enough to dream big, but it's also near enough, it's not high in the sky, it's not 50 years from now. And you use that frame of Shemitah within the Jewish calendar to help envision your community coming out of COVID including in relationship to environmental sustainability, but not 